Um, this is our sixth Phosphorus Forum, but ironically, we've never had uh, a session on uh, sustainable fertilizer production. So uh, we wanted to do that, and we've got a great uh, cast of characters up here to talk about it. Uh, you know, there are a lot of areas in uh, mining and fertilizer production that can be improved in terms of phosphorus efficiency, whether it's extraction of the phosphate rock, conversion of the, to fertilizer, or use of recycled materials, or uh, you know, supply chain changes. Um, and so these guys are going to talk about those. I've asked them to give a brief bio of themselves and talk a little bit about their companies. And then they're going to uh, present a, a case study of something that they've addressed in their own operations to make phosphorus production, phosphates production more sustainable. Um, I think that's all I had to say. I think we can go ahead and start. So Carl, maybe we'll start with you. And uh, you can introduce yourself and give your case study, and then we'll move down to Ron and then to Adam. I'm Dr. Carl Wine, Director of Agronomy at Nutrien, and Nutrien is the world's largest fertilizer producer, NPK and sulfur. Uh, total, we produce about 27 million tons per year across that Nutrient portfolio. We're headquartered out of the resort city of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Go there in January, it's amazing. Um, maybe July, when I'm trying to escape the heat here. And uh, Nutrien is, is interesting because we, we operate mines and nitrogen production facilities, but we also have a retail arm called Nutrien Ag Solutions, and then we have a proprietary line called Loveland Products. So we have this ability to, to influence phosphorus sustainability across the supply chain from the mine all the way to the farm gate with what we're doing, and so I'll, I'll dive into that a little bit. I did want to make note that uh, many, many years ago, Back in 2011, I was involved with the, uh, the Phosphorus Sustainability Conference that we had at ASU. Jess Corman was there, Jim was there, of course, uh, and it's really cool to see this thing come, come to life and, and move forward, so thanks for having me. All right, come on. Uh, Do you have slides? I don't have any slides. Okay, thanks, Carl. Uh, my name is Ron Restum. I'm the uh, Chief Commercial Officer of a company called Ostara. I think we have been members with uh, SPA since its beginning. Uh, I've been in the industry this June 45 years, a long time, uh, and almost all of it has been either in retail ag selling to farmers and or production ag selling to retailers selling to farmers. So I spent my whole career, most of it, on the fertilizer side, a little bit in the chem side, but the majority of the fertilizer in the last 15 years in the sustainable nutrient efficiency side. So the first 33 years of my career, I was with a company called Agrium, which is now called Nutrien. And so half of it with Nutrien Ag Solutions in California, and then the other half with Nutrien Wholesale Side in Michigan and in Colorado. And then uh, after that, I went to work for Coke Agronomic Services, Coke Industries in Wichita, Kansas. And we had several nitrogen additives to make nitrogen more efficient and a product called ESN. And then after that, I went to Coke, which is why I live in Wichita now. Uh, and it, well, I just said that. So at Coke, we also had a product called Super U and Agritain, products that you apply on nitrogen to make them more efficient uh, for the sustainability. Then I did a couple of years in the biological business. I quickly realized that biostimulant world is, is exciting, but there's more companies than there are people in this room, and it's getting worse every day. So it's just so overcrowded, most of the industry has either had a corporate direction or have totally turtled, and they aren't going to make a decision until somewhere down the line to see who exists. So about three and a half, four years ago, I came here to work at Ostara because one of the things we had always struggled with uh, at the other companies I was with was phosphate efficiency. There was a lot of work being done with nitrogen efficiency, and we had that at Coke. We had that at uh, Nutrien with ESN, but the phosphate market was sort of an untapped market to try to bring some efficiencies to it beyond rate and, and, and application methods. So I've been at Ostar here, like I said, four years. We're two pieces of a company. One half of our company is a wastewater treatment side, which we've been in since 2005. So I say we're kind of an old new company. So we have 26 of these locations across the globe, between Canada, the US, and, and most of Europe. 26 of these facilities We've treated billions and billions of gallons of wastewater treatment, and what we do is we pull the ammonium phosphate out, add magnesium, and make the mineral struvite. So we've probably produced 100,000 plus tons of this product and have sold every bit of it every single year, uh, and have it no. And then we've got 
three more plants coming up right now. Uh, one, a new one in Ireland, a new one in Poland, and a new one in Israel. I had the benefit of landing in uh, October 7th in Tel Aviv, which was the last commercial airline to land that day when the war broke out. So three days later, I finally got out. But, and then the other half, like I said, we pivoted in 2020 to look really more at the fertilizer and then the sustainability and the efficiency of it. So we ended up building a plant in Florida and we've just about ready to commission a new plant in St. Louis. So between the 26 wastewater treatment plants and between these two plants, we'll be producing about a quarter million, maybe 300,000 tons of a product called Crystal Green, which is Struvate. Thanks, Ron. And Adam? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, good morning, Adam Herges, uh, Sustainability Agronomist Advisor with the Mosaic Company. So we're a Fortune 500 company based in the U.S. here. Um, our two key products that we manufacture and market are uh, phosphate and potassium. So we're on the P and K side. So of course we get a lot of questions on nitrogen, which our product definitely has nitrogen on. But uh, the fortunate thing for me is I get to focus on water quality issues and not climate issues for the most part. Um, I reside in Minneapolis, Minnesota, used to work uh, in various capacities with the Department of Ag in Minnesota, uh, and then I worked for the Soybean Checkoff uh, organization for a number of years, and then have been at Mosaic now for about eight years. So I wear a lot of different hats. Uh, I'm on our corporate public affairs team, so uh, majority of my role is really trying to address adoption and implementation of our nutrient stewardship practices. So we do that through collaborations, through partnerships. Um, Mosaic is on a lot of different uh, conservation organizations, boards. So how do we influence and get them activated on for our nutrient stewardship? We know that you know, four hours is not going to solve all of our problems, but most of the science is pointing to the fact that you know, if you're not addressing four hours, you're not addressing the foundation of crop nutrients and management of that system and all the other things that we can combine with that, regenerative ag practices, conservation practices, edge of field practices, will only actually influence and, and create more positive outcomes tied to the use of that fertilizer in that farm field. So from a science perspective, four hours is probably only gonna be about 11 to 15% of your uh, nutrient load reduction. Um, a part of your strategy. So, but we need that as a foundation. Um, and then of course, wearing so many different hats, I also focus a lot with our sustainability team. So uh, understanding our reporting and talking about, you know, our water use in our production facilities, our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I focus mostly on the environmental impacts tied to our crop nutrient products. Um, but we're also, you know, our company came out with an ambition uh, towards net zero. So I work closely with multiple teams across our organization, leading sort of the nature-based solution strategy work of that. Mosaic has a lot of land. Um, you know, in central Florida, we have roughly 365,000 acres of, of land that we own, uh, and that is mainly for mining, right? Um, but we don't mine that, ma that many acres every year. It's roughly 2,000 acres. So, how do we enhance that land resource to actually look at how do we make you know, improvements on the landscape through restoring soils uh, from previously mined lands, but also how can we enhance the carbon um, uptake of those ecosystems with some of our land holdings. So a whole suite of different areas that I touch on. So glad to be here. Great, thanks Adam. So we'll get to the case studies part now. Um, and we can go down the same uh, order of presentations here, but. If you could tell us about something that you faced inside the company's operations that you had to uh, change or work on from a sustainability perspective, how that happened. And I think one of the things we're trying to get at here is um, if there are research discoveries out in the world uh, that are made, how does that get operationalized within a company, uh, companies like yours? How does that, what does that pipeline look like from um, the, the discovery to the actual implementation of it? So. Carl. Sure. So I, uh, for the case study, I'll just pick uh, something that I'll, I'll even talk about more tomorrow on how we innovated phosphorus. We took plain old vanilla map, monoammonium phosphate 11520, and we screened several different companies so that we could add nutrients to it. So we came up with a new formulation called MAP plus MST, 
and I know it's a super imaginative name. Uh, MST stands for Micronized Sulfur Technology, in case you need a tattoo when you leave. Um, I'll give it in the lobby. Um, so we, we, what we wanted to was take our map and make something different, make an innovative product. And where that starts is just such a challenge because there's so many technology providers in this business right now. Ron mentioned the biostimulant companies. You know, you, you stick your neck out and you get hit with 2,000 meeting requests, right? And so it's trying to figure out who, who has technology that's ready to go right now that meets current economics and is scalable. So going through that screening process takes a considerable amount of energy and lots of folks behind the scenes at Nutrien that are sitting in Zoom calls and Teams calls and in-person meetings to try to figure out, of, out of all this noise, what's the signal that we should pick up on and extend out for further development. So that, that takes a considerable amount of time. So if you are working at a startup or you plan to work at a startup, having that scalability in mind because once this thing's ready to go, it's like, okay, now how do we go from zero to 100 miles an hour on the freeway? very, very quickly. So it, we, we struggle the most there uh, just with our partners. So I think that's a, a piece where we've been able to take our current platform and our current production footprint and innovate it so that we have, have a new product. And it, and it also helps us with uh, you know, just taking a, a phosphorus supply and, and extending it out a few years into the future by uh, making a new product. So Matt, do you want any more detail than that? No, that's great. Um... If I'm going to give you a 20-minute infomercial tomorrow, so just uh, and a tattoo, brace and a tattoo, <laughs> prison style. Uh, we'll be drinking at the Pedal House tonight, so that'll be a good thing to do before your tattoo, probably. Um, always leads to good decisions. Ron, sure thing. <laughs> Ours is a little bit different because we're not, uh, you know, a big fertilizer manufacturer like these guys are here. But one of the issues we had was. Like I said before, we have these 26 wastewater treatment plants. They make a great deal of the struvite for us, but if there's 50 million tons a year of phosphate sold, which we had a meeting the other day and we kind of used a graph, you could take a hopper, hopper train rail car filled with 100 tons, connect that rail car all the way from Orlando, Florida to British Columbia and back again, and that's about 50,000 tons of fertilizer dumped out every year. So we're producing 25,000 tons out of a wastewater treatment plant. Doing a lot of good with struvite, considerably reducing runoff and leaching and tie up and increasing microbial activity in the soil. And all that's great, but it's not gonna make a major impact. So where we needed help was to try to synthetically manufacture struvite without liquid wastewater from a wastewater stream because the world's largest wastewater plant sits in Chicago. We have three large reactors making crystal green there, but with six million people feeding that facility, you're still not gonna produce more than 10,000 tons. So globally, it's gonna be hard to really, we're, we're gonna help those cities that have been, you know, depositing all that fertilizer back into rivers and creeks. We're fixing that. We're giving them clean water and pulling out fertilizer. So we had to figure out how to synthesize and make the product differently, of which we have done, but that really required us to reach out to Anybody we could find in the industry, we worked hard, we looked at our IP, we looked at their IP, we had consultants come in. At the end of the day, as much as we'd like to have been able to use the phosphate industry to help us, we were making a different product. And to make ammonium phosphate, it, it's a different process. You use a great deal of heat and you use a dryer and you can crank it to it. When you make struvite, you cannot dry it the same way they do. So we have 100 foot long dryers, completely different heat because we're trying to maintain these six waters of hydration in the molecule. So every time we'd bring in a phosphate consultant, they'd tell us to crank the heat and we wouldn't make struvite anymore. And then we'd bring another one in. So eventually, we used the industry as best we could, but we ultimately just had to figure it out ourselves. And, and so there's some of that, I think, in, in some of these new smaller companies trying to make a go, you have to kind of figure it out yourself because the globe wasn't ever making this product before. Yeah, and uh, to maybe touch on um, what Carl said, so Mosaic, our technology is called Fusion Technology, um, but very similar. Way cooler sort of name, a, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always, uh, it's always fun coming up with names in, in a corporate setting. Um, but that, that was one area that we focused on as well was, you know, you look at uh, the Lieberg Law of the Minimum, right? Synergies between different nutrients and how it's taken up in the plant. So we, we modified a, a map 
product, um, monoammoniated mono -ammoniated phosphate. Uh, we modified that into what our um, branded product now is called Microessentials, right? So we're adding zinc and sulfur to one granular fertilizer for better uniformity across the field, but also uniformity of nutrients uh, next to the plant roots. Um, two er other areas on the more of the production side, you know, manufacturing of phosphorus uh, is very energy intensive. Maybe not as much as nitrogen production, but it is still energy intensive. And we use a lot of water. Um, so when we're doing strip mining to reach the phosphate rock matrix underground, um, there's a lot of water that's used in creating that into a slurry so we can transfer it around our operations and get it back to the manufacturing plants. And so, you know, I'm not an engineer, but any ways that we can drive efficiency within those processes is always something that I think a lot of our companies are always looking to do. Um, so part of that, you know, Mosaic, we've driven down our water use. We now capture and reuse about 90% of the water that we pull out of the ground for our operations, as well as cogen. So um, actually manufacturing phosphoric acid uh, creates a lot of heat. Um, and so at Mosaic, we have a couple of cogen um, operations connected into our manufacturing process where we actually take that heat that's um, developed out of that sort of chemical reaction and we pump it back into our energy grid. So we're actually producing more energy at some of our facilities and putting back into the grid um, for that use as well. So any ways that we can drive efficiencies within those processes from an engineering standpoint is one of the areas that we're constantly looking at. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's interesting. I think when I think of agricultural supply chains, I think of, you know, especially with Nutrien Mosaic, I think of you're at sort of the very early stages of it, right? But you have your own suppliers. Energy is one of your inputs, but you also have, you know, sulfuric acid that you have to deal with and other things. Can you talk a little bit about your supply chain sustainability efforts and what all goes into that and what you worry about? from a supply chain perspective. And it could be probably best directed to Carl or, or uh, Adam here. You want to go first? I, well, I can, I can tackle it if you want. Um, just a change of uh, order here. Um, oh yeah, I'm not going in order, sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, a lot of these key ingredients are resource dependent, right? So sulfur is a byproduct of oil refinery. So as a global society, as we continue to you know, remove our independence on fossil fuels, um, that is gonna have, you know, trade-offs down the road. Um, and so we're not gonna be able to, you know, mine sulfur from volcanic active regions, right? That's, there's, there's issues around um, worker safety, right? Uh, how much sulfur is there? So, so those things we're, we're constantly looking at is, you know, how do we continue to have sulfur as a part of the manufacturing process as we're looking at depletion of actually generating sulfur production around the world. Um, so that's one area that we're constantly looking at and tracking. Um, and then I would say too, um, you know, ammonia, right? So Mosaic, we're the largest purchaser of ammonia in the world um, because we do produce a lot of MAP and DAP products. Um, and so looking at the ammonia side of production, you hear two major areas, right? Green ammonia and blue ammonia. Um, and so as we're looking to drive renewable energy into the use of production of ammonia, that's gonna be um, helping in terms of reducing our scope three footprint for our company. But also if we look at you know, ways to produce ammonia through hydrogen, um, that is going to fundamentally change, I think, the footprint of nitrogen production globally, but also change the footprint um, even for a company like Mosaic since we um, buy so much of that product. So advances in that and getting it to scale. Um, you know, I, one example, we've had some conversations with folks in the past around generating ammonia through methane production at landfills. Right, really great circularity of a story there from a sustainability perspective, but we need scale. And so if you're looking at you know, tapping into that sort of production system where you take methane from landfills to generate ammonia, you know, we're only talking about 1,000, maybe 10,000 tons of product. And for a company our size, you know, Carl mentioned, what, 27 million metric tons across their suite of nutrients. 
You know, Mosaic, our operational capacity is around 26 million tons. Um, and we produce phosphate roughly, I think last year, our SEC filing said about 10 million metric tons of phosphate products that we produced last year and sold. You know, the US market, or actually North America in general, is roughly around 10 million metric tons, right? So we need scale and volume. Um, so these discovery phases are very important, but then how do we take it to the next level? Do you have anything you want to add to that, Carl, or do you want to press your luck or pass? No, I'll, I'll give it a whirl here. Um, I think one sustainability piece with respect to supply chains that keeps us up at night, besides energy price and, and resource availability, you know, we've the whole industry has run into a lot of transport issues. If you if you got to make it, you got to move it, right? And so we've had been tremendously impacted by rail strikes. You know, getting potash out of our mines in, in Canada. Uh, conveniently located right next to the mosaic mines. Uh, interesting how ore bodies work. Um, and, and getting stuff on ships. You know, we've, we've gone through historically low water levels in the Mississippi, which, expect, which impacts the traffic of fertilizers and other materials moving up into the Midwest for planting season, and also the uh, products moving out, especially with the harvested grain. And then we've also had issues with the Panama Canal being under drought. So we've had to make some big changes on how we move materials based on, uh, I think, just some unprecedented challenges with marine and freshwater transport. Labor strikes have always been a, tr a, a problem. And then I think we also have issues with just finding the truck drivers to move that last mile. And that's, uh, I think, we're kind of coming out of this post-COVID, where we had a lot of truck traffic and, and truck uh, operators. They, they moved into other positions. and so. That's not, I don't know if that's really a sustainability issue, but it's, it's definitely a transport headache, which ultimately impacts our ability to do business. Thanks. Great. Uh, Ron, here's one for you. Um, sure. And uh, you, you have a novel product, I guess you could call it, um, in MAP as a fertilizer product. Um, and you deal with a very conservative industry in agriculture, and you've had a lot of experience working with them. So. Uh, with farmers, et cetera. Uh, so what's the, what's the pitch look like to get a conservative in industry to adopt a new product like yours? Uh, and you're right, it's, it's really tough. I know you can kind of leave, leave a lot of meetings like this, this or a lot our industry meetings and you, you kind of think you've really got something and you're gonna go and then you start to see the resistance in the field. And the resistance in the field is, you know, unless it's a real problem and they wanna fix it, they're right now don't think they've got a problem with MAP or DAP or MTS or Micro Centrals. You know, so the farmers think it's okay. Most retailers think it's okay. They know it's not as efficient as it could be. They know it's causing some problems, but not to the degree that you guys understand it. So that challenge is number one. I don't have a problem, so why are you here to fix it? So you spend a lot of money and a lot of energy and time trying to explain the problem to them. And we're a small company, so that's a lot of work to kind of get around and do that. Um, so that's the number one challenge. You're fixing a problem they don't think they have. So you, you gotta get that. Then you go, since we don't sell directly to farmers, they have a business that does, they have a business that doesn't either. So you don't sell to farmers, you gotta get the retailers. Retailers are gonna say, I have five bins that I store dry fertilizer in. Which bin do you want me to take out? Do you gotta take out MAP? No, I gotta have that. Take out urea, I've gotta have that. Take out potash, essential. How about the micro centrals? And maybe you've got one other product. So now you gotta figure out what can't they sell? And most likely everything they've got in there they should sell. So now you're, you know, you're left with are you as a small company or either one of these two guys going to buy a bin for somebody? And if you put a tank up in Canada where we have a lot of them, they're twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. You add on bin space here in the US, could cost you a quarter million dollars, cost you half a million dollars, depending on the infrastructure. So that, that slows it down. There's just operational problems with it. And then they'll look at who's gonna have Who's gonna, who am I gonna compete with this new product? Because I'm not gonna take on this product and go out there and convince my sales guys and give you time with all these sales guys. And they're gonna get trained up and they're gonna switch what we're doing and we're gonna maybe put in a bin and we're gonna do a program with you or we're gonna have to commit to X number of tons for X number of years to pay your money back. Then we're gonna go out to the farmers and get them to change. And then we're just gonna find out you sold the guy down the street after we did all this work. The business got created, the guy down the street gets it and undercuts us because he didn't do any of that work. So you have to overcome that. So you think about limited distribution and then you gotta determine that I picked the right guys because whoever you don't pick is gonna say everything bad about your product because they didn't get picked. So you gotta filter through 
who's the innovator, who really wants to do it. You know, while you're listening to everybody, you're just going to eventually sell your company to Nutrien, and then they're going to be my competitor, right? <laughs> <laughs> that, that happens on a regular basis, and you really do have to answer that question. How viable are you? Are you going to be here? Where's your money come from? What's your exit strategy? They assume if you're a, a startup company and you've got venture capital money or you've got a family house money, they know that your goal and, you know, of your investors is an exit. So who are you going to exit to? Is that going to be good for me or bad for me? So there's a lot of things that retailers take into mind before they're going to take anything out to a farmer, change what he does, and then become dependent upon you. So those are just a few of the challenges, let alone we're not big enough to have all the answers we should have. So skepticism comes into play, and then you've got to overcome it, and which is why you see a lot of startups don't make it. By the time you answer all the questions, the industry is used to seeing answered by Bayer's and Syngenta's and, and these two guys. All that massive data is what they expect from something new. And by the time you get it to them, you probably ran out of all your investment money and you're broke. And nobody will invest in you anymore because all you showed them is you burned up everybody else's money. So it's all that timing is. So, you know, when I listened to the, oh, the three speakers before me, you know, they felt like they could go up and do our presentation for us, and I'll just tell them, we built a product that isn't water soluble, that uses roots to, you know, dissolve itself and take it up, you know, but, but for us to get up there, we don't have that credibility. So how do you find it? How do you do it? It's a real challenge. Innovation is much, much more difficult than anybody thinks. Even if you're a large company like these two guys, and I was with Nutrien for 30 years, it's still a lot to overcome, because unlike what you think, farmers aren't excited about change, especially if what they've got is working, and retailers are definitely reticent to change. If it's not going to be more profitable, if it's not going to be easier for their business, and you can't overwhelm them with data. And those are three things that are not always easy to come by. That doesn't sound so hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Carl, but did you want to add anything? We're on our way. <laughs> Yeah, I'd echo Ron's points here. You know, the ag farmers are an interesting customer because they expect a finished good, even if it's new to them. And it's, and it's finished in terms of it's how much you know about the product's behavior in the field, how much data you have, how it handles. So we're a little bit challenged because the industry and our end customer is not tolerant of, of iterating as you go and improving as you go. You have to deliver you know, the full finished shiny product at your launch. And that can be very difficult. I worked for a startup just down the road in Gilbert here, and we had the same tr problem. It's like, well, we don't know that answer. Let's go spend some money and time figuring it out. And meanwhile, you know, the world just keeps moving on, and it it's always a challenge. So I think aligning the culture of a startup with the culture of agriculture is, is, is hard because they turn at two, the gears turn at very two different rates, and they're very different sized. Um, I'm not an engineer, so I'll, I'll uh, leave my gear ratio uh, <laughs> example at that. Um, but it's, it's always been a struggle. The innovation's there, the ingredients for innovation are there. It's just trying to get it all to line up so that it's ultimately ex accepted and, and purchased by someone at that middle point of the supply chain for the grower. Okay, great. Um, I have one more question, and then we'll open up to audi audience questions. I'm not sure if we have a mentee slide after this, Olga, or not. I think we might not. I think I took it out. Okay, good. Okay. Um, so the last question of mine, and then I'll shut up, is um, how has, uh, we're going to the first question, <laughs> how has uh, mining evolved uh, technologically? So how has the extraction process changed? What, what sorts of efficiencies have been introduced? And Adam, maybe this is a good question for you. Yeah, well, I, I would say mining has been on the forefront of innovation. Um, I mean, I just look at the history in Florida, right? Bone Valley, we, you know, we had phosphate mining started there late in the 1800s. There was a lot of companies at that time, probably upwards of 100. And a lot of those same lands are being remined today. So with technology and advancements there, we're able to actually go back and extract that phosphate rock um, in ways that we haven't done it before. So a good example of that, I guess you could think about, and I don't want to compare us to the oil industry, but you know, you look at fracking, right? And, and so some of the technology advances there. 
On the, on the potash side, and I'm just gonna mention that, automation, um, that's coming to the forefront in mining um, globally. And so, you know, Mosaic, we opened up a new mine called, uh, at Esther Hazy called K3, where a lot of it is automated, right? We have robotic machinery moving down there. So <clears throat> from a worker safety standpoint, that's terrific. We're, we're not putting more people in danger because, um, you know, these, these are pretty extractive processes. Um, but we found ways to re reorganize that workforce and, and provide them opportunities in other ways um, through the mining operation. So automation is probably a big driver that we're seeing today. Even in our phosphate mines, our operators that, that operate our drag lines, um, a lot of them are remote, so we have an operation room. Um, and then using drone technology and different cameras to actually get a full scale view of what's going on out there. Um, and then using even drone technology to look at issues that might pop up in our systems, right? There's a pipe leaking. Well, we don't have to send somebody out there and waste a bunch of time. We can fly a drone over there, see it, capture it right away, and then respond. So even efficiencies in responding to um, operational issues that occur is, is greatly improved. Okay. When it comes to marketing, what features or product char characteristics do farmers value in a fertilizer? Sustainable supply chains versus effectiveness or convenience? Well, I would say that the main indicator is price, um, right, and, and nutrient content and quality. I think those are the main, main issues. But as we look at, you know, how do we drive value-added products to the marketplace? How do we move beyond traditional or commodity fertilizers with some of the technology like the nutrient mentioned and, and even at Mosaic, it's really looking at the farmer's bottom line. So if we have a value added product, right, that maybe has a slow release micronutrient like sulfur or zinc, um, when you're looking with, at the farmer's you know, operation, what value is those additional nutrients providing to the operation? Do you see an increase in, in bushels, right, per acre? Um, so at the end of the day, the farmer is going to get paid for bushels. So how do we increase productivity? Um, and then as with this surge of sort of interest in soil health and the soil health transition to regenerative ag, um, you see market incentives popping up all over the place. So there's different revenue sources for farmers today than there ever has been in the last 30 years. Some of those key components can come into those discussions, but I think at the end of the day, it comes down to quality. Um, you know, how does the product actually work with equipment, but then the price, right? So even today, we still have some hurdles that we have to get over. And, you know, at the end of the day, we got to make sure that this farming operation is profitable um, because if they go bankrupt, there's no business anymore, right? So um, those are some of my probably comments on that area. Hello? Oh, hi. Uh, can any of you gentlemen speak to, from a global supply chain perspective, are you seeing any of your product move into lithium ion uh, phosphate battery space? I can take this one. Okay. So, so uh, Nutrien has a small uh, phosphate business. We're only 3% of the global phosphate supply. A tiny fraction of that is our industry uh, products, and that's super purified phos acid, things like that. Thanks, thanks for killing the feedback. Um, and so we have some products moving into that, to that EV space for the batteries. Uh, it's still a little new. There's other alternatives out there with, with, with nickel uh, sources. So it's, it's, it's starting to grow. It's certainly, it's certainly been a point of conversation of which direction does do, do fertilizers go or mine materials. Are we a low cost nutrient source for farmers or does this transition into uh, an EV future really change the, the dynamics of supply and pricing across the globe? Good yeah, question. Just maybe to add to that, so, you know. Mosaic, we've been publicly looking at this. Um, you know, here in the US, we're not quite doing it at the scale that is probably needed for transitioning to EV batteries. But China's been doing it for a long time. Um, so you've seen, you know, they used to be upwards of 15 million metric tons of phosphate into the marketplace. They're, they used to be roughly 30% of the global trade of phosphate fertilizers. Um, and that has slowly been scaling back. And a lot of that 
is mostly due to environmental regulations. You know, they have to move their facilities away from some of the rivers where they're seeing um, contamination, but also this rise in, in lithium phosphate derived batteries. So we've seen China move, you know, roughly a million metric tons of fertilizer production to upwards of two million metric tons of fertilizer production into phosphoric battery production. Um, so that is happening um, and it is occurring. And, and so, you know, companies like Mosaic, we're looking at that today. And that's probably all I can talk about on that topic. So. Um, how efficient is Struvite as a phosphorus source compared to DAP or MAP? Is there research available that compares these different phosphorus sources? Oh, we, we think it's uh, extremely efficient compared to MAP and DAP. Um, now, most of our recommendations do go with MAP and DAP. Uh, we know that struvite is not water soluble, but it is citric acid or oxalic acid, root exudate acid. Um, so we know that it's an extremely efficient phosphate fertilizer, and we know it doesn't run off, it doesn't leach, so you could you know, fill up a swimming pool with it and you're not gonna get an algae bloom because it's not gonna dissolve. So we know it's real efficient. What we're working on with, with our continued research is what is the right rate, what's the right ratio with microessentials, MAP with MTS, because we know in so different pH soils, different phosphate level soils, different temperature of the soils, that that crop may need some early water soluble phosphate to get started. And then pretty much from that point on, Crystal Green takes it through the rest of the season. So we know it's a highly efficient phosphate fertilizer. We know it doesn't have any environmental tail risk on it. It's just, again, we're going to produce 250, 300,000 tons against a 50 million ton marketplace. So we're really zeroing in on where it creates the greatest value. And we're, we kind of know where that is in geography wise, crop wise, and soil type. So if we ever get to a point where it could be 100% Crystal Green, then we would feel great about the fact that all of what we talked about here in these last presentations could come to an end. And Ron, where are you seeing the best research on, on the comparisons between us? Uh, you mean the, the results Green of that and, research yeah. or who's doing the research? Who's doing it, who, yeah, who's where, doing where it? is it being published? Um, we have work with Kansas State, we have work with the University of Illinois, we have work with almost all the land grant universities here in the US, Western Canada, as well as Europe. We're also looking at one more of, of like fall applied phosphate versus spring applied, because we know fall applied phosphate's gonna have a lot less available come spring, where we know you can put crystal green in the fall and it's identical looking in the spring. And then we're also working with the University of Illinois on that nitrogen loss as well, because we're assuming fall applied MAP or DAP may have 67% of that nitrogen's gone. And so we're kind of looking at how does, how does crystal green create value in that scenario as well. That'd be nice if that was the number. Yeah, I think it's it probably higher. higher. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to be nice to these guys. So. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I have just uh, one question about uh, the production of MAP and DAP. Uh, Fertilizers, which are knowing what they are, what they, that are, they are a conventional fertilizers. Do you think that the use of such fertilizers can contribute to sustainable phosphor use for fertilizers? And the second question: uh, What was the contribution of uh, resources and the progress you make until now? You want me to grab this one? Yeah. yeah, I think you gotta define who the user of the fertilizer is. Is it the ag retailer who's taking a, a MAP uh, or, or DAP as a base ingredient and then adding their own technology to it to make some sort of fertilizer 2.0? Because that can be some sources of efficiency of uptake and, and innovation. Or is the user the farmer who can actually do some field practices, taking soil samples, aligning their applied amounts with what's actually in the soil so your, your phosphorus cycle stays tight. Uh, and then also, you know, banding your, your phosphorus or applying it below ground and incorporating it so it can't run off. There's also some great, great uh, opportunities for improving sustainability. And, and we talked about the mining piece earlier. I think that's, I think, a unique thing about the phosphorus supply chain is that every step along the way, 
from the mine to the, to the farmer to the fork to the waste treatment plant, we all play a role in making sure that we're optimally using that nutrient.